Hello. I hope you all are having a very good snow day, at least part of a snow day. And tomorrow, since we're canceling class, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Susan Muadi Daraj's story, The New World. I'm hoping that you have already considered the questions for consideration. I think they'll help you sort of think through what's going on in the story and process it a little bit. But um, to uh, sort of start off the consideration of the story, I wanted to make sure you knew that Daraj is the daughter of Palestinian immigrants. She was born here in the United States, but um, you know her parents had experienced coming to the U.S., so she had some firsthand knowledge of their experience. Uh, but the story is set in Philadelphia. And you probably figured out as you were reading along that the family is Maronite Christian. And the Maronite Church, which we mentioned a while back in a, um, one of our discussions of uh, Middle Eastern literature, is uh, Catholic. It's under the Catholic Church. And um, so the character, um, Siam, her home before she came to Philadelphia is, was Jerusalem. Um, and remember that Jerusalem is on the border straddling the West Bank, which um, belongs to Israel and Palestine. So, and it's split in half. <laughs> so, you can imagine uh, some of the things that she's talking about where there's some conflict going on. Okay, so, um, when she comes to the United States and they are living in a particular area of town where there's a lot of sort of uh, merchants living there and uh, a lot of immigrants, you can see that the parts of town are, are kind of segmented, right? Um, she, uh, on page five, I have my book here and I'm going to be looking at some of these pages particularly. So if you want to follow along, you can. Um, she describes her neighborhood. She, it says on page five, Siam enjoyed exploring their new neighborhood, taking long early afternoon walks through, the, through South Philadelphia. The streets were neatly arranged, perfectly organized like a grid. Numbers ran north and south, names ran east and west, or was it the other way around? She and Nader lived on Ninth and Passionc in what they called the Italian market. Layla rarely visited which was her friend, because the crowds were too much for her to handle with her young daughter. Siam found everything at the Italian market, from tomatoes to fresh coffee beans to bath towels sold by everyone from leathery Vietnamese women to Sicilian men with mustaches like nodders to young Irish women with green eyes and their reddish blonde hair and tight braids. Some of these Philadelphians were immigrants like her, and others were the children of immigrants with an entire generation to adjust. So she kind of um, foreshadows a little bit what's going to happen with her family because the children have a different um, experience. You know, they sort of transition into American identity. Um, but also, we see a little bit about the town when she talks about um, trying to go to the place where the blonde woman lives. So she walks uh, to the address and it says it took her 40 minutes of brisk walking and she realized that as she'd worn bad she realized that uh, she'd worn bad shoes for such exercise she also noticed that as city blocks streamed slowly by her the sidewalks displayed less litter and she goes on to talk about you know how the the setting is a little bit different and she says the sidewalks were red brick not tan cement blocks separated by tufts of grass trying to break through the men on these streets wore dark suits, not blue jeans, and the women got thinner with each block. And that thinness is um, kind of a theme, isn't it? Because um, the gifts that her husband gives her, um, of, of all of those, one of that really impresses her is the Barbie. And um, she ends up calling this blonde woman uh, attorney Barbie and homewrecker Barbie. <laughs> so... And she says that, you know, the women here were thinner than they were in her country. And she's learning that thinness, at least in contemporary society, is associated with wealth or with um, at least relative wealth. Um, so the Barbie, let's look at that real quick. On page four, says, uh, this was the most amusing thing that he brought her. 
um, the most American doll of all who could do everything from astrophysics to zoology, all with her long pl blonde plastic hair perfectly quaffed. So um, the Barbie carries through the story as well because, you know, toward the end of the story, um, Siam has lined up the Barbies on the nursery shelf. So we'll come back to that in a minute, see what we think she's doing with that. Um, what about Carla, the daughter of the woman who owns the florist shop downstairs? So Carla's really middle-aged, and yet she's living with her mother, and she's not married. Um, the descriptions of her tell us that Siam, at least, thinks she's kind of ominous. She talks about um, how Carla handles the lilies, <laughs> And uh, is a little bit scary. Let's see. Um, on, uh, well, I don't know where this is. She, she goes down to see Carla, and Carla is busy arranging the lilies, and she snaps the head off of a lily. Um, it, here it is on page 8. Carla approached them with two lilies in her hand. The long stems coiled like serpents. And then later on, um, it says, Carla casually snapped the heads off the lilies, and Siam watched a lone white petal float to the floor. So she's a little bit nervous about Carla. Of course, we find out later that Carla uh, is bitter for a reason, and um, she does not trust men. And so the evil eye is an important concept in the story, and the evil eye is, at least some of the time, associated with Carla. What kind of threat does Carla pose? One moment, I have to let my dog out of the room. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, what? Can I take off? Can I take off the roast? <laughs> yes. It's a dang like two uh, extra minutes. <laughs> Thank you. It's hard, isn't it? I'm still doing it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Life happens. Okay. So. um... So Carla, um, maybe the evil eyes is to some extent posed by Carla because she is kind of against the kind of marriage maybe that Siam is picturing for herself. Um, and she's associated with, you know, her hands are like serpents. Um, okay. So, um... While all this, while she's trying to adjust to American society, Siam is studying language, and her approach to language is interesting. She keeps conjugating the verbs, um, and it says on page four she practiced her English like a religion. Nader had bought her bought her a primer and an Arab English dictionary, yet another present, and she studied it for at least an hour every morning. So the words she's studying in the beginning are. Anticipate, expect, wait, I wait, you wait, he, she, it waits. Um, seems to indicate that she's pretty optimistic right now. She's sort of, she's wanting something to happen and she is hopeful, right? Um, however, you see a, a shift in her tone when she thinks that Nader is cheating on her. And on page 12, uh, after she goes to see the, the woman to see if, you know, I guess she's trying to decide if she's a real threat. On page 12, it says, um, she spent the rest of the day studying her verbs. I hide, you hide, he, she, it hides. I lie, we lie, they lie. I cry, you cry, he, she, it cries. I cry. Um, expressing herself in English is not easy for her anyway, and it's as if she, while she is learning the language, she's also learning the um, kind of harshness of trying to assimilate into a, a culture. Um, what are some of the differences in women's roles here in this, uh, the, some of the different women in the story? Um, if you remember, you know, Siam seems really vulnerable while all this is going on, but when... Um, 
Nader first met her in Jerusalem, he was really impressed with her. She was studying literature at the university. She, uh, he liked her ability to bargain with the merchants in the marketplace. She was actually pretty assertive while she was in Jerusalem. And her family was a wealthy family. Her father's a doctor. And then she comes here and she really doesn't have any status. Uh, she can't even use the language in order to kind of control her environment the way she would like to. So she feels, um, you know, all the uncertainty of being in a new place with new rules and new um, kind of uh, social mores. You know, she says that wives are different here than they are in Jerusalem. She says that, you know, marriages are different here. She says, you're, you're not, you know, you're supposed to be friends if you're married. Uh, a marriage was a friendship in America, not a spy operation. You're supposed to be cool about things. <laughs> so um, she's trying, I mean, it's, it's, you can imagine how overwhelming it is trying to uh, sort of internalize all of this. And every day, Nader is out working and she's sort of at home. She doesn't really have um, a lot of options for sort of figuring all this out. Um, so she feels less equipped to move about in American society. Um, she feels very threatened by the blonde woman because she's a professional. She, you know, carries herself differently. And, um, of course, she seems like a threat because she keeps calling for Nader and there's something kind of mysterious about it. Um, what do you think that it means when the blue stone shatters? This happens while they're making love in their bedroom. Um, and I don't have a nice clear interpretation of this. It seems like um, it could be associated with the possible destruction of their marriage or maybe it's a sign. It's a sign of her superstition. It's her way of warding off the evil eye. Um, so if it shatters maybe it's a sign that, that the baby that she's going to become pregnant with as a result of their lovemaking will bring a new culture um, and will sort of move away from or snuff out the traditions that are so familiar to Siam. Um, you know, maybe it is a kind of shattering of the old way of life that she's used to. Um, but I don't know how you interpret that. Of course, she wants to order three more of those stones at the end of the story to make sure that evil doesn't come into their house. Um, so one of the questions is, what is evil in the story? The evil eye itself is an old idea, and, and it uh, exists more, more than in um, Middle Eastern culture. It, it exists in a lot of cultures. Um, and what it means is, it's, um, it, it's when someone looks at you with jealousy or malice, it's like they can... Um, basically curse you with that look. Um, so to counteract it, uh, the blue stone reflects the glance back to the person who, who was staring. Um, so the blue stone is reflective. And um, the, another way to get rid of the evil eyes to scare it off with curses or obscene gestures. We'll, I think we'll see a little bit of that in um, one of the other stories. So... Um, so she is kind of superstitious. She's Christian, but she's also um, kind of superstitious in other ways. There's some things sort of attached to her Christian um, rituals, like the evil eye. Um, but what is evil? Is it Carla, somebody who has no faith in men and is kind of bitter? Is it the blonde woman who um, is strong and independent and so therefore maybe a little bit scary? Um, or is, is, or maybe, um, by introducing the idea of evil in the story is, is Daraj challenging the notion of evil itself? I mean, is there any evil in the story? And is she just revealing that it's, it's just difficult to go through this kind of change and that you, you know, it would be nice if you could just ward off evil, but that in fact, you just have to sort of navigate, you know, the tumultuous waters of uh, immigration and assimilation into a new culture. Um, 
I believe that's all I had to talk to you about. I hope that you go back and look at those questions again and think about them in light of, of what I've said and your own reading of the story. And um, if you have any questions, please be sure to send them to me by email or you can ask me in class. And then those who had cards to comment on this story, we will try to get to those next class period. Okay, thanks.